And uh, before I sort of uh, begin, I'd just like to uh, quickly introduce myself. Jalal Mola, I'm a partner with Grant Thornton Singapore. I've been uh, doing transfer pricing now for over 20 years and have worked across the breadth of solutions right from transfer pricing planning and advisory to uh, documentation to supply chain restructuring and APAs, maps, uh, uh, as well as uh, transfer pricing litigation. Uh, the topic today is extremely interesting because it talks about uh, a subject which is pretty close to all our hearts especially during a time when we're all sort of struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, over the last few months, we've all been pretty much working remotely from home and have been grappling with issues such as uh, trying to stay safe and healthy, trying to sort of uh, maneuver our work from home with internet connectivity problems, etc., etc. But now as uh, the... Uh, circuit breaker in Singapore and the lockdowns in various parts of the world open up and we sort of start heading back towards business as usual, going back to our workplaces, etc. We'll start grappling with more larger organizational issues uh, that will emanate out of uh, uh, sort of business slowdowns and uh, sort of work being impacted over the last uh, uh, four to five months. As we sort of observe organizationals which, have, which are facing these implications on account of the slowdown, we'll see significant impact on their top lines and the bottom lines of their organizations, which will sort of lead to certain profitability squeezes. And considering that transfer pricing largely uh, focuses significant uh, uh, significantly on the organizational and uh, company profitability. This could have a direct implication on transfer pricing. Based on this, our objective of today's webinar would be to identify some of these transfer pricing issues emanating out of the business slowdown and try to sort of explore opportunities and solutions on how we could sort of proactively mitigate some of the risks or the transfer pricing risks that emanate on account of this business slowdown. Okay, let's first quickly take a look at the impact on businesses. On the left hand side of this uh, slide deck, we've tried to sort of uh, analyze what could be the uh, impact of the COVID-19 related slowdown on, uh, from a geographical basis. This particular chart is looking at the GDP growth across various uh, regions and across various countries, uh, trying to map out what the situation or the growth percentages were pre-COVID vis-a-vis the calibration post the COVID-19 situation. And as we would sort of all observe that uh, the world economy was uh, anticipating a, an overall GDP growth in percentage terms of around 3%, but has now been muted to around 1% or so. Similarly, China, which is probably one of the biggest suppliers across the world, as it's pretty much uh, has significant manufacturing capacities and manufacturers for pretty much the rest of the world, had anticipated a GDP growth in the region of 6%. But post-COVID, it's sort of recalibrated its growth closer towards 1% to 2%. If you look at the demand side, where most of the products and services are sold, you see that the US, the UK, as well as the Japanese economies are looking at actually a degrowth and hence showing an extremely serious situation from a geographical location. Why this is so important from a transfer pricing perspective is because uh, transfer pricing uh, is basically a cross-border subject matter. And as you can see, with most economies being impacted due to the business slowdown on account of COVID-19, the transfer pricing implications will not just be local, but will be felt across the world. Similarly, when you move away from geographies to industries, you'll notice that the industries are also 
anticipating significant downturns with most industries probably save the pharma and the healthcare industry most other industries are sort of uh, looking at a significant degrowth or a significant depression you'll notice that there are certain industries like the travel industry and the hospitality industry as well as the manufacturing and the construction industry where the impact will be felt significantly more as with, as if, and as is the case of the oil and gas industry keeping this in mind we just want to sort of focus upon some of these key industries and how the impact uh, will be felt on these industries the largest obviously the travel and hospitality industries uh, with our borders being sort of pretty much shut for a significant period of time and people being very wary to sort of fly from one location to the other you've seen a lot of airlines being a, a lot of airplanes being grounded and being parked right now and uh, pretty much operating at extremely negligible capacities what's also happening is that some of these airline companies have well, while while their revenues are largely squeezed and are pretty much uh, negligible they have a huge operational cost such as lease rental that they need to pay uh, parking and maintenance charges uh, as well as like you know maintaining a staff because of this you've seen a lot of companies airline companies facing huge losses especially in the region of 250 billion loss anticipated in the airline companies and you've seen some of these companies already going in for uh, sort of restructuring. Similar to the hotel industry, uh, similar to the travel, uh, to, to the airline industry, you've got the hotel industry, which again are linked and are facing sim uh, uh, similar difficulties with uh, extremely low occupancy rates, with sort of staff uh, being retrenched. Again, these companies are going to for, sort of face significant losses. Moving from travel and hospitality to the manufacturing industry, this is another industry that has been significantly impacted by COVID-19 as well. As we all are aware, uh, the manufacturing industry is highly dependent upon, uh, dependent upon workers being able to travel from their uh, work uh, from their home to the workplace to carry out their manufacturing operations. With the COVID-19 restricting the ability to commute from one place to the other place, you'll notice that a lot of manufacturing plants and factories are sort of operating at extremely minimal capacities. Similarly to the uh, movement of people, uh, the manufacturing industry largely is dependent upon the free movement of materials, components and products as well, as well as machineries. With a lot of company, with a lot of countries not allowing the exportation of goods, with the actual exportation being difficult and uh, free flow of material being impaired, is another reason why factories are pretty much now operating at uh, less than optimal capacities. All this would have a significant impact on the manufacturing sector as well. Oil and gas is one of the industries that has probably uh faced one of the largest sort of crunches ever i mean this is the first time historically we've uh, seen the u.s oil prices for some of the crude products fall to zero and even in the negative i mean in a pretty uh, jocular manner one could say that the oil companies would be actually paying you to pick up their products but that's really not the truth one of the reasons why the oil and gas uh, industry is facing such a huge uh, impact is largely because of a huge disruption in demand. With the drop in uh, the airline sector not operating at full capacity, with the auto industry not being able to sort of increase their sales, uh, with uh, a manufacturing industry facing huge sort of uh, capacity uh, issues, a lot of the demand has been significantly disrupted on the supply side or on the production side the very uh, the production of oil is a very expensive uh, operation and hence the fixed costs for oil production and oil exploration companies continue to take place which is why with sort of low uh, low demands and high production and high storage costs there's going to be a significant impact on the oil and gas industry as well
similar to the uh, manufacturing industry construction industry also relies significantly on the free flow of materials and the free movement of people to sort of work at the construction sites since these are impaired and uh, and uh, impacted similarly the construction sector will also face significant impact having seen impact on some of these industries let's look at what the implications could be on the uh, profit and loss or the profitability and the financial statement of individual companies operating in these sectors with the employees not able to sort of work at full capacities or sort of uh, trying to work remotely and not being uh, as efficient as they would at their workplaces this would create implications and on the sales and on the profitability of indi individual companies similar with production with sort of plants and factories working at like you know half or like you know limited capacities this would impair the sales of the particular organization as well as have impact on the overall profitability of the company demand would again be quite uh, impaired because most consumers would at this stage not want to sort of spend on non essential items and hence certain industries or companies working in some of the industries such as fmcg white goods etc would face significant impact on their sales and profitability now in order to survive these companies will require to sort of drop their prices to be a lot more competitive in the industries leading to price pressures leading to again impact on profitability on the cost side you'll find a lot of companies now sort of spending a lot more on technology because working remotely working from home etc is going to look to be the new normal in the years to come which is why you'll find a lot of companies spending a lot more on laptops on sort of smartphones on sort of vc facilities etc impacting the entire cost side of their profit and loss account and again impacting the profit so in just the impact will be felt significantly due to sort of drop in sales drop in uh, turnover and service income as well as like increase in cost due to technology spends all in all leading to leading to the profitability is being highly squeezed for uh, organizations across industries and across geographies as well let's look at how this could impact uh, the transfer pricing because very often transfer pricing policies and transfer pricing strategies are generally sort of uh, sort of done during sort of uh, years or periods which are business as usual and hence when sort of we go into a downturn this could have a significant impact on transfer pricing arrangements as well to sort of explain some of the impact on a transfer from a transfer pricing perspective what we've done is we've simulated uh, profit and loss uh, accounts for a particular company over a period of four years as you will see this company seems to be an entrepreneur manufacturing company which has sales cost of production which is the manufacturing sort of related expenses it also sort of uh, trades in uh, finished goods uh, due to which it imports and sells finished goods which have been bought from the parent entity to ensure that it's efficient in its manufacturing processes this particular entity also pays royalties for the use of brand and know-how to its parent entity as well as pays management fees for management support that it receives from its parent organization as we notice that this particular company used to be extremely healthy in the good years it had an increasing trend in sales it had very healthy profits but come 2020 this particular company started having a significant dip in its sales and turnover the cost remained more or less stagnant with sort of slight increase on a uh, percentage basis which led to a significant dip in profits wherein a healthy company earning profitability margins of around 25 percent went into the negative from a transfer pricing perspective this would sort of be a perfect case to be picked up for transfer pricing scrutiny as it's got falling sales it's got falling margins as well as has a significant percentage or a significant volumes of intercompany or related party transactions uh, 
across its uh, sort of operations. Now the problem is that uh, we need to ensure that we are able to sort of provide a very robust defense to some of the transpricing scrutinies that may come up during these troubled years. And the objective hence would be to sort of look at potential uh, solutions or potential strategies on how to sort of make our transpricing defense a lot more robust so we can sort of handle our transpricing scrutinies in a more effective and efficient manner. One particular uh, strategy or solution would be to review our existing transpressing policies. As I had alluded to in one of my earlier slides, transpressing policies are generally sort of set up in good times or in business as usual periods and very often do not factor in the potential implications that could come upon us during sort of downturns or business slowdowns. The transpressing policies are generally documented sort of arrangements that the group sort of fixes at which the various independent or the individual companies within the group are to sort of transact. Very often they have policies for royalties, you have policies for purchase and sale as well as sort of service fees. Let's look at some of the sort of uh, policies that may be impacted which may need a relook or a review. Starting from royalties, now very often to ensure uh, administrative ease, very various companies or various groups try to sort of put in place an absolute royalty payment between the licensor company and the licensee company to uh, ensure an uh, optimal or an arm's length payment towards the use of brands or towards the use of know-how. In my particular example, I've tried to use a Singapore company's uh, profit and loss account, uh, wherein a royalty payment has been uh, agreed based on the policy document. As you would see in the last row, there's a royalty charge which has been anticipated or factored in that a Singapore licensee company will pay its US licensor parent, which is uh, agreed at 1,000 for 17, 2,000 for 18, 3,000 for 2019, and 4,000 for 2020. Now these absolute royalty figures, the royalty numbers were basically worked out based on a policy document that was prepared by the group, which was based on a 10% royalty charge on the anticipated turnover for the particular Singapore licensee company over a period of four years. Now, if this policy is not reviewed during the downturn, one will sort of end up paying these royalty amounts, even on the sort of sales figures, which will not sort of live up to the estimations or to the uh, expectations of the licensee company. I mean, when the royalty amount of say $3,000 for 2019 was sort of uh, worked out by uh, the group, it was on an estimated sales base of $30,000 of sales that the Singapore company should have uh, earned during this year. But the actual sales has been largely depressed leading to a significant effective royalty rate, which would not really be approved by the transferring authorities if we go into uh, a transferring scrutiny. Because of this, in such cases, it becomes extremely important and imperative for companies to sort of relook at their royalty policy. And in case the sales needs to be recalibrated to the current situation or to sort of take, the, take in the impact of uh, the business slowdowns, we need to sort of go back, relook at our royalty policies and ensure that it is in line with the business expectations during the business slowdown periods. Another important aspect of the transfer pricing policy that may need a relook or may need a sort of further strengthening is in case of purchases and sales. Uh, very often you'll have your company uh, purchasing raw materials and purchasing finished goods from uh, a parent company or from a group company which are then sold in the local or regional markets or used for manufacturing of finished products in case of raw materials for sale in the local or regional markets. Now, as we discussed earlier, because of uh, sort of uh, 
the flow of raw materials and flow of finished products being impacted uh, because of travel restrictions and restrictions and exports by various com countries. Uh, during the slowdown period, there may be a sort of a situation where instead of importing the raw materials and the finished goods from the group or from the parent from an overseas jurisdiction, you may have a local entity trying to procure the raw materials and the finished products locally. This is known as substitution of the group products or the group raw materials with localized products. Now, very often uh, in such cases, it becomes extremely imperative for us to sort of review our transfer pricing policies and our transfer pricing practices that have been documented to ensure that we're able to sort of differentiate the products that we used to sort of buy from our groups or our parent entity from the sort of products and the raw materials that we buy from third parties. Very often there may be a huge amount of differences in the quality of the raw material, in the sort of volumes that we buy from group versus by, uh, the volumes that we buy from third parties. There may be differences in sort of trade terms such as FOB versus CIF pricing. There may be differences even in the credit terms that have been agreed with the group versus the uh, third party. There may be difference in functionality such as quality testing, etc., done by the group in case of group purchases, with the with the, the entire quality sort of uh, function moving to the local entity in case they sort of purchase or procure from third parties. It's extremely important to sort of document these uh, differences in products, functions, and uh, trade terms between group purchases and third party purchases to ensure that a transfer pricing officer during scrutiny does not try to sort of use the third party pricing to use as a comparable and controlled price to determine the arms price in case of purchases from the group. Hence, of very, very imperative to visit your transfer pricing policy document and build in some of these factors as a part of your policy. Another aspect where I've seen where it may be important for us to sort of review our transfer pricing policy is in case of service transactions. Now, very often you'll have a Singapore company or a local company uh, procuring significant services from a group entity just to ensure efficiencies within the operation. More often than not, these services could generally include a plethora of services, including relatively high-end services such as R&D services, software, uh, 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 software, um, uh, software services, or even procurement services, which are known to be relatively higher end in the value chain of the service bouquet. Uh, the particular entity may also be sort of procuring or partaking in certain relatively routine services, which could be uh, accounting services, which could be administrative services, etc. And just to ensure that, like, you know, there's efficiency in administration, the group may agree upon a probably a blended sort of cost plus margin which could be towards the higher end of the uh, curve to ensure that uh, uh, the arm's length principles are being met both at the service provider as well as the service recipient's end. Now, it's important to note whether and to sort of analyze whether all the services that you're sort of paying this cost plus 25% margin is actually being provided by the service provider. Because very often during these slowdown periods or during these lockdown periods, you'll probably find that you're able to sort of substitute some of these services by localizing or by doing a lot of these things in-house as well, or probably not using these services at all during these lockdowns, so, uh, during these lockdown periods. In such cases, one may really need to go and check whether it really needs to sort of go and pay the entire cost plus 15 or cost plus 18 percent, the higher margins that have been sort of really uh, agreed between the service provider or, and the service recipient, or do these margins or do these costs need to be muted to take into consideration the uh, situations on ground. Again, important to revisit the policy to check whether 
you're actually paying for the correct services or are you overpaying for services that you didn't receive at all? So basically this talked about going in and reviewing, reviewing your transfer pricing policies to ensure whether what you're paying for or what you agreed by way of a policy document is indeed correct and indeed valid during the periods of uh, economic slowdown or sort of uh, 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 lockdown periods. I mean, these are just some of the examples that we've sort of uh, provided here based on things that we've seen in the recent uh, past. Obviously, you may have other sort of transactions where you may need to sort of revisit the policy. It's just important that we go back, look at our policy documents across transactions and try to realign them with the uh, realistic business situation. Apart from uh, uh, reviewing your transfer pricing policy, it's also important to ensure that we are able to build a very robust transfer pricing defense documentation because that's the sort of document that's going to sort of speak your story or help you when you sort of go in for a transfer pricing scrutiny or a transfer pricing audit with the tax authorities. To sort of demonstrate this uh, robustness of transfer pricing documentation, we will just try to sort of uh, provide an example of a typical operating uh, model, which we've seen in the manufacturing industry, uh, which would sort of be used as an example to sort of uh, try to help uh, explain the robustness of the transfer pricing documentation that needs to be built up. In this example, we've considered XYZ Limited, which is for the sake of this discussion, a Singapore manufacturing company, which works as a localized entrepreneur uh, for sale of products within the Singapore and the regional markets. XYZ Limited or the Singapore company is actually a manufacturer and manufactures and sells this product as well as imports some of the products from its group entity for resale in the local market just to ensure it's able to supply the entire bouquet of products to its customers. For the purpose of manufacturing, it licenses know-how and brands from its uh, parent organization, which is XYZ Group in US. It also procures significant uh, management and support services from its group entities to ensure that it's able to take in uh, or, or use the best practices that have been developed by the group. And some of its surplus manufactured products are also exported back to XYZ US since it's able to sort of tap into the export market as well. So in GIST, XYZ Limited, the Singapore company is an entrepreneurial manufacturer. However, it sort of does import significantly from the group entity for raw materials as well as finished products. It pays uh, royalties for uh, license of know-how and brand as well as pay the management fee. Let's look at what a typical documentation would look like in the ordinary course of business. In the ordinary course of business or very often based on experience we've seen a lot of companies try to adopt what is known as the overall TNM or a highly aggregated uh, form of documentation wherein all these individual transactions of purchase of raw materials, purchase of finished goods, license of know-how, uh, payments for management fees, etc., are, are aggregated at a company or an overall company level and are sort of and the profitability of this particular company is then analyzed vis-a-vis -vis that of its peers within the industry and where the margins are found to be at uh, okay or in line with the margins of its peers. By implication, each and every transaction, which includes the raw material purchases, finished goods purchases, exports, royalty payments, and management fees are then all set to be at arm's length. This is known as an aggregated or an overall TNM approach, uh, followed by a lot of companies. Now, there are two uh, issues with this particular approach. What the, the first issue is that uh, this approach is pretty much flawed even from a legal perspective because the transfer pricing regulations in Singapore as well as a large number of countries in the region as well as around the world 
talk for a, a, a call for a transaction by transaction approach to be followed because it there's always the worry that the profitability from one transaction may subsidize the profitability from another transaction and hence it's imperative to look at each transaction separately on a standalone basis that apart from a more practical perspective while this approach may work and may sort of get you through during certain good years which are the 2018 and 2019 where this company has had extremely healthy profits this approach would sort of fall flat in years when the company which obviously is an entrepreneur and can make profits as well as incur losses this particular approach may actually sort of fall flat in loss years or in years where the company has not really made sufficient profits as we can see for the years 2020 and 2021. In 2020 and 2021, we will notice that this particular entity, probably because of slowdown, has incurred significant losses. And even though the individual transactions may actually be at arm's length or may be sort of developed in a very scientific manner, because the company has incurred losses and because you sort of the uh, particular taxpayer has preferred to use an aggregated approach over the period of time uh, this would actually jeopardize each and every independent in each and every individual transaction of that particular company only due to the fact that it's earned uh, or incurred a loss on an overall basis now this is extremely risky because for certain small value transactions or for certain transactions which are in any case at arm's length, because the co company is adopting an overall profitability approach, each and every transaction will actually undergo a transfer pricing adjustment, which will lead to huge penalties and huge sort of interest implications as well. And hence, it is extremely important that companies start relooking at the transpressing documentation approach and start moving from a overall transaction uh, of overall profitability approach or company level aggregated approach to a transaction by transaction approach and this change uh, needs to be made now for your 2019 documentation itself rather than wait for 2020 to 2021 where the problems or where the losses really start uh, incurring it's extremely important and prudent to start making these changes right from 2019 onwards keeping this in, this in mind we've sort of tried to look at different approaches or different uh, strategies that could be used to look at each of these transactions separately rather than aggregating them as a whole. Let's look at one of the most common transactions that we see in a manufacturing industry and one of the transactions that we've got in our example, which is the import of raw materials. Now, in our example, the Singapore company imports raw materials from its US-based parent entity for the purchase of manufacturing and resale uh, for the purpose of manufacturing and selling of finished products uh, in uh, Singapore as well as uh, within the region. Now it's extremely important to sort of go back and check whether these raw materials have been procured from third parties by my parent entity or whether they've been manufactured in-house. Very often these raw materials are procured directly from third parties where the role of the parent company is merely to sort of uh, uh, procure it, ensure that uh, there's efficiencies of scale uh, achieved and the uh, same uh, materials are then distributed to the manufacturing company in Singapore. In such cases, the analysis becomes extremely uh, easy because all you need to do is look at the third party cost from the third party at, uh, from whom your parent entity had procured those uh, goods, check the margins or the distribution margins that have been retained by the parent entity to ensure whether the same are in line with the arm's length principle, and uh, your arm's length test is then met. Let's look at the example that I have at the bottom of the screen wherein the parent company purchases these raw materials from a third party at $100 and sells it to the Singapore company at $120, leaving behind a gross margin of just 20%. Now, instead of trying to analyze the overall profitability of the Singapore company, which has tons of transactions, 
it becomes a lot more easier and a lot more appropriate to just ensure that the 20% margin that's been retained by the US entity is appropriate or not by looking at distribution companies in the US and ensuring that these margins meet the unplanned test. It's so much simpler and so much more easier and it does not expose the entire PNL of the Singapore entity to transfer pricing scrutiny. Similarly, in cases where the raw materials are actually manufactured by the parent company in US, you could again conduct a cost plus phase uh, analysis at the US company level just to ensure that its manufacturing margins are sufficient and are not overstated. Or you could look at a cup or a comparable pricing approach in case the US parent is selling the same raw materials to third parties within Singapore or within the region as well. It just ensures that you're limiting your analysis to the transaction as such and not exposing your entire profit and loss to the transfer pricing scrutiny in the Singapore region. The other transaction that we can sort of look at is the export of goods. Because again, uh, in our example, you have the Singapore company manufacturing and selling locally, as well as exporting some of its surplus products in the US market. As against, uh, um, uh, as, as the case in the importation transaction that we discussed uh, earlier, even the export could be a very negligible or a very small part of the overall operations of the Singapore entity. And hence it becomes extremely imperative to sort of look at the transaction per se, rather than aggregating this transaction as a part of the overall profitability of the group. The export of finished goods could probably be for two reasons. One, the Singapore company would be selling the goods or exporting the goods to its US parent, who would then go and resell it in their local markets. The second uh, approach could be if uh, the Singapore company sells or exports the goods to its US parent, who then further uses it for manufacturing uh, finished products, which are then sold in their local market or on a global basis. In case the US parent is only reselling the goods, one could sort of look at the overall profitability of the US parent from the purchase and resale of the products rather than looking at the margins of the Singapore entity. Because in this case, the uh, US parent becomes a relatively simpler entity to test and to check whether its gross margins are not overstated from the purchase and resale, which by implication would sort of ensure that the uh, profits of the Singapore company are also at arm's length. In this example, let's take a situation where the Singapore company is uh, manufacturing these goods at say a cost of $45 and are selling it to the US entity at say $100. The US company is purchasing the products from Singapore at 100 and selling it to third parties at 110, leaving behind a gross margin of just 10% in the US. The, it's much easier to test whether the 10% is reasonable in the US, which by implication would mean that the $100 at which it, the Singapore company sells to the US company is also at arm's length rather than testing the overall profitability of Singapore company in this example. Similarly, in case where the Singapore company manufactures and sells the products to the US parent, who then uses it for further manufacture, instead of aggregating this transaction in the overall profitability of the Singapore company, it could be much more easier and much more relevant to just test the transaction itself rather than aggregate this transaction with the overall profitability of the Singapore company. The next typical transaction, which is usually aggregated to the overall profit and loss of the company are the management fees. Now the management fees are generally based on my experience, hardly around three to 5% of the overall turnover for a particular company. And hence aggregating it with a large number of other transactions is just sort of like, you know, asking for trouble. And hence important and imperative to sort of look at this transaction on separate phases by conducting a three phase analysis to sort of demonstrate the appropriateness of the management fees paid out. The first approach is to sort of ensure that or ensure or analyze that 
the services have actually been received in respect of which the payment has been made. The second step is to analyze and document the needs and the benefits that have been that have accrued to the uh, Singapore company for due to which it is uh, willing to sort of make these uh, management fee payments. And the third step would be to sort of test the arm's length pricing for the management uh, fee transaction per se, rather than aggregating the same uh, on an overall basis. When we talk about like evidencing the receipt of the services, it becomes very important to sort of prove and demonstrate as a part of your transfer pricing documentation that the recipient company has actually received the particular services. This could be by way of uh, sort of uh, keeping on record and as a part of your transfer pricing documentation, email communications or sort of travel reports, etc., to sort of showcase that the service was actually received and absorbed by the Singapore entity. The second test is the needs and benefits test, wherein you, the Singapore company needs to sort of demonstrate and document why these services were needed, the fact that these were not duplicative in nature, why the Singapore company could not sort of conduct some of these activities in-house and why it required these services from a group party or from a related party from an overseas country. And also what are the benefits that have accrued to the Singapore company from these services that have been provided to the Singapore company. The benefits could be in the form of enhanced sales, reduced cost, sort of improved technologies, improved quality of products, and imbibing some of the best practices that have already been developed by the group. But all this needs to be sort of documented and analyzed as a part of your transfer pricing documentation. The last step that one needs to sort of uh, uh, have as a part of your documentation for the management fees is to sort of demonstrate the arm's length nature of the fee itself. And that is usually done by sort of analyzing the cost base of the charging entity to ensure that the costs that are being charged to the uh, recipient entity are appropriate and are linked to the service fee. The markup that has been sort of uh, uh, used uh, to sort of demonstrate the value add by the service provider is appropriate and is backed up by a scientific, uh, a scientifically performed transfer pricing benchmarking to demonstrate the appropriateness of the margin for these service fees. And the last part is to ensure that the allocation that's come to the Singapore company, because this is generally a global cost, which is allocated across uh, related parties. So the Singapore company needs to demonstrate that the allocation key used for allocating the cost uh, for the management services to Singapore is done appropriately and based on a reasonable allocation key. So once you have these three tests in place and properly documented, uh, uh, document, uh, documented as a part of your TP study, it sort of gives you an extremely robust defense to sort of defend the management fee charges as against sort of aggregating it with the overall profitability of the group, which could sort of again create a significant issue from a Singapore transfer pricing perspective. Similar to management fees, you'll have royalties again, which are again an intangible payment, which again becomes extremely difficult to sort of demonstrate and hence idly should not be lumped up with the rest of the transactions, but needs to be sort of culled out and analyzed separately on a standalone basis by demonstrating the benefits that have been received from the technology payments and in a separate cup or a profit split analysis to demonstrate that the royalty charge, whether it's 5% or 10% of the sales, has been properly sort of computed and has been uh, proper, properly determined to be at arm's length by uh, conducting various analysis using certain well-known databases such as royalty stat or royalty range and looking at some of the royalty rates of your industry or your peers who have been sort of licensing similar technologies and similar brands. This sort of analysis will give a lot more robustness to the royalty payment uh, transaction and help you sort of demonstrate the appropriateness of the transfer pricing arrangement in a much more efficient and in a much more correct manner we, uh, with the tax authorities in Singapore. Overall, 
the gist of this entire discussion so far is to sort of move away from a highly aggregated approach for your transfer, I think documentation move on a transaction by transaction basis, wherein each transaction is tested separately, such that even if your organization or even if your company is incurring loss on an overall basis, so far as the transactions for the individual transaction, so, so far as the pricing for your individual transaction and at arm's length, you can still sort of put in place an extremely robust defense and safeguard yourself from adverse transfer pricing implications. Now, just having a robust transfer pricing documentation and moving from an aggregated basis to a transaction by transaction in itself may not really be sufficient all the time. Because very often, even for a particular transaction by itself, uh, you may actually have difficulties uh, defending this particular transaction, largely because of the contemporaneous nature in which we prepare the transfer pricing documentation. Let's look at this particular company that's trying to sort of defend a particular transaction for the year 2020. Now this company, because of business slowdown and because of certain uh, uh, issues that it has faced uh, due to sort of business uncertainties in 2020, has earned a margin of 10% from a particular intercompany transaction. However, when we are preparing this particular transfer pricing analysis or the transfer pricing study documentation, the comparable data for the year 2020 uh, is really not available because we are preparing this on a contemporaneous basis. So we tend to rely on margins or financial data for the comparable companies for earlier years. In this case, we've used an average of 2017, 18, and 19, which have been relatively good years, and hence the margin of the comparables is much higher than that of the taxpayer, because this taxpayer's margins are relating to a difficult period in 2020. Now, does this automatically mean that my pricing arrangements of this particular taxpayer are not at arm's length because they're not in line with that of the comparables? The answer is obviously no, because we are really not doing an apples to apples comparison here. What we're doing is we are sort of comparing margins of an earlier period with the margins of the current period, which is giving us an extremely warped sense of the arm's length test. To ensure that I'm able to do an apples to apples comparison, comparison and to ensure that like, you know, the business or the operating realities of 2020 are brought into the average margins of the comparable companies as well. One could probably look at certain types of adjustments that are possible. One such adjustment is the period adjustment or the tenure adjustment, wherein we try to sort of uh, adjust the margins for earlier periods to bring in the realities of the 2020 period in this example. What we've done out here is uh, try to look at the quarterly results of some of these comparables over a period of 2019 and 2020. As you would notice that the margins for these companies uh, in Q1 2020 vis-a-vis -vis Q1 2019 is much lower and has an adjustment factor of around 33 to uh, even 60 percent in certain cases. So these adjustment factors could be sort of built into the margins of the comparables to bring them in line with uh, the 2020 uh, scenario and hence enable a more realistic or reasonable comparison. In our case, when we've done this particular adjustment, we've been able to sort of get the comparable margins down in the range of 9% to around 11%, wherein uh, the comparison, uh, comparability for our 2020 margin becomes more realistic and a lot more reasonable. Now, in some cases, if the data is not really available, for looking at Q1 financials for some of these companies for 2020, one may then need to do some sort of an operations adjustment wherein the operations of the uh, taxpayer are sort of aligned with uh, that of the comparables. We've tried to sort of demonstrate this by a particular 
simulated PNL for 2020 for my Singapore taxpayer in this case, wherein we looked at uh, this company has had a particular amount of sales, has had raw material consu uh, uh, raw material consumption, has had huge factory overheads and salary payments, as well as various other expenses, leading to a profitability of around 6.25%. Now, if we was really going to analyze the profitability of this company in reality, we realized that this is an unregular or an, or, 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 or an irregular year, wherein this particular company has been sort of, uh, has had its factory, which has been shut or has op been operating at 50% of its capacity for a large part of the year. Further, a large number of employees were pretty much non-operational for a, uh, half the year. And hence, from a operational perspective, the 6.25% margin that is being shown is really not in the normal course of business and cannot be compared with that of its peers or that of its comparables who have been operating at uh, uh, optimal capacity in earlier years, which whose data we're going to sort of use for the, purpose of, for the purpose of benchmarking. So what we've done in this case is we've done certain operational adjustment, wherein we've sort of adjusted the factory overheads to reflect its uh, correct positions, wherein we've reduced the factory overheads by 50% uh, to remove out the irregularities. And we've done a similar adjustment for the salary, salaries and wages of the employees as well, wherein we've sort of recomputed or recalibrated the profitability to 31.25% by removing the irregularities or the one-time events that have taken place on account of the business slowdown. Now, this gives a more true or more correct picture of what the operating margins from this particular transaction would have looked like had it been business as usual situation and is now comparable to the margins of the comparables or the operations of comparables who actually been, been operating in business as usual situations in 17, 18 and 19. And this now gives us a lot more apples to apples comparison or a much more reasonable comparison uh, by removing some of the impact of 2020 uh, on this particular company. So this is another adjustment that we could do to sort of align the operations of the uh, taxpayer with that of the comparables to ensure that we get a more realistic measure of the arms length test. Now, this is another adjustment that's possible and something that we can explore to ensure that we are able to get a correct comparability. So just in gist, uh, one needs to sort of go back, look at your transfer pricing policies, look at your transfer pricing documentation to ensure that we are sort of being able to put in an appropriate and correct defense. One needs to ensure that the transfer pricing studies and the transfer pricing analysis are moved from an aggregated approach to a transaction by transaction approach. One needs to sort of go back and see whether we need to sort of start putting into place uh, appropriate adjustments to sort of align our transfer prices for 2020 and 2021 in line with the business realities and start sort of doing these things from 2019 in, in itself. We need not wait for 2020 to sort of happen and yeah, explore for looking at certain other alternative uh, methods to sort of defend your transfer pricing, be it by way of APA, be, be it by way of going for sort of advanced ruling, just to ensure that we are able to sort of mitigate ourselves from transfer pricing risks that may emanate from uh, lower profitability and lower sales on account of the business slowdown. I think this was just, uh, certain points that I wanted to share with you and I'll be glad to take any questions now. I mean, you are free to sort of unmute yourselves and sort of ask the questions or you're free to sort of even sort of uh, send them to the question box as well. I've got a few questions for you, Anja. Um, so the first one is, some of these solutions and adjustments you have suggested, such as capacity adjustments, are these feasible? Have they been used before? And are, is there any precedence on acceptability by tax authorities? 
Perfect. I think that's a fantastic question because most of these adjustments and most of the strategies that we mentioned in our presentation are based on actual uh, situations. I mean, as we're all aware, we did have this business slowdown or uh, in 2008, 2009 as well during the financial crisis. So some of these adjustments and some of these approaches of moving away from an aggregated approach to a transaction by transaction approach, uh, doing these capacity utilization adjustments during this period uh, and tenure adjustments have actually all been uh, practiced in real life situations have actually gone through tax scrutiny in certain uh, geographies and have stood the test of transfer pricing litigation as well. So they're all tried and tested and they are extremely feasible and doable as well. I, I hope that answers the question, whoever's asked the question. Thank you, Mandra. I've just got a few more for you. Um, so the next one is, would there be any adverse implications if we shift our TP defense documentation from overall aggregated TNMM basis to a transaction by transaction approach? Uh, there could be adverse implications if you start making these changes only in 2020 when you start incurring the lower profits and losses which is why it's advisable to start changing the manner in which you start maintaining and preparing your transfer pricing documentation right from 2019 onwards wherein it's been a relatively good year where it's been business as usual and not doing 2020 as an afterthought because that's where a transfer pricing officer may start questioning you in these loss years for being inconsistent in your approach so my suggestion is that yes I mean, start making these changes to your documentation in 2019, where it's easier to explain and easier to sort of demonstrate these changes for being for truly technical purposes rather than just as an afterthought. Thank you, Manjo. Um, Should we stop royalty charges and payment of management fees in years of slowdown? Not really, because I think there's really no reason to sort of st stop these payments as long as you're sort of utilizing or as long as you're exploiting the uh, intellectual property that's uh, sort of owned by someone else or as long as you're sort of uh, partaking the services that someone's providing to you, there's really no reason to sort of make uh, stop making the payment because it's important to understand that there's going to be transfer pricing at the other end of the transaction as well. So you, I mean, trying to sort of uh, mitigate the risk by not making a payment in Singapore, you may lead to transfer pricing risks for the organizations in some other jurisdiction. Which is why, I mean, I, I would never really uh, sort of advise you to stop making the payment. It's just put in place a lot more robust uh, uh, do documentation. And as well as relook at some of these policies, because as I mentioned in one of my earlier slides, some of these royalty payments may really not be appropriately priced at a particular point of time, take into consideration the slowdown. Some of the services may not really be being provided during the slowdown. Yeah, factor for that. But I mean, in entirety, I don't think it's wise to stop making the payment because to sort of protect yourself in one country, you may be creating an issue in some other country. Thank you. So these are the last two. Um, how long will it take for Grant Thornton to review the TP policies and prepare documentation? It's pretty, it's, it's quite dependent on the number of transactions, the complexities of operations. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, I think, I think on an average or probably just as a sort of a ballpark, we generally take around four to six months to sort of complete an analysis or a policy document for a reasonably complex operation. But I mean, it's difficult to sort of like, you know, really put in uh, an, uh, it depends on a lot of factors, but I think in the ballpark, you'd probably put it as four to six uh, weeks. And final question for you. If you review our TP policies and suggest a new one, can you advise when our company should apply the new policy in the next financial year or immediately? Is there anything we, can, we should consider when applying this? 
again, a fantastic question. Again, I mean, there's no really straight jacket answer to that. And it depends from transaction to transaction and op uh, operations to operations. Also, in uh, at what period during a particular year are you planning to sort of build and uh, implement the policy? But more often than not, in simple, sim uh, in more simplistic operations, which are generally service fees or which are you know, simple purchase sale transactions, you could start implementing the policy in the year in which you design it. You need not wait for the next year. I mean, if there are any sort of inconsistencies uh, for the period that's already gone by, you could always sort of like, you know, uh, take corrective measures for that period, but you could start implementing implementing the new policies for rather simplistic transactions in the year in which you develop the policies itself. You need not wait for the next financial year. Okay, Munjo, we've just had one more question come in. Um, how do we look to access transfer pricing in, in, Southeast Asian uh, in Southeast Asian countries? Holding is in Singapore, but we have our business operations in Malaysia and Indonesia. Sorry, could you repeat that question? How to look to access transfer pricing in Southeast Asian countries? I, I assume the question means, if the holding is in Singapore and the business operations are in Malaysia and Indonesia, how could this potentially affect transfer pricing? I mean, it could affect, depending uh, again on the number of transactions, because today, uh, I mean, you've got a Singapore company which is dealing with a Malaysian company and an Indonesian company. And if some of these companies are not operating at full capacities or where the sales are pretty much muted and the operational costs are pretty significant or are in the ordinary course of business, you're going to sort of impact your sort of profitability across this region, right? And this will sort of lead to sort of transfer pricing scrutinies going on simultaneously in uh, multiple locations leading to uh, significant issues. So for such an organization, it would be extremely important to sort of go back, relook at your transfer pricing policies, ensure that like, you know, you factored in for some of these issues, make the adjustments for capacity under utilization or make the adjustments for differences in tenure and uh, start preparing a central documentation in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia to ensure that you're extremely consistent in your approaches across these three regions, such that like, you know, a tax authority in Singapore cannot uh, use an alternative analysis done by someone else in Malaysia or Indonesia to create a, a transfer pricing adjustment in Singapore. So just, just be consistent in your approach and in your principles and that should actually help you sort of put in a robust defense across these three regions. Great, thank you, Manjo. That's all of our questions for today. So I think we're ready to close. Brilliant. And I think if people have questions or if who want to sort of like, you know, sort of mull over some of these issues and ask questions later on, I think just feel free to sort of send us an email. We'll be glad to sort of address your questions over an email or uh, even over a telephone call. Great. Thank you, Munjo, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Sure. I hope this has been useful for everyone. Bye-bye.